Good afternoon and welcome to the Authors Guild webinar on the art of adaptation. I'm Cheryl Davis, the general counsel of the Authors Guild, and I'm pleased to have with us Richard Viteri, a guild member who has recently had his book, The White Envelope, published this month along with his play, Zaguada. So congratulations on that, Richard. Thank you. Uh, we're here with Richard to discuss the art of adaptation, and I'm here to add in any uh, elements about answering questions about legalities and about the business uh, elements of protecting your rights when you decide to work on an adaptation. So I'm going to hand it off to Richard. Um, great, thank you, Joe. There's a few things to remember for novelists and playwrights is that a screenplay is a different animal. Um, I'm always telling uh, students of screenwriting that um, screenplays are moving pictures connected to moving pictures. And by that, I mean it's entirely visual, the opposite of a novel and the opposite, obviously, of a stage play. So when you are adapting either in your own material or someone else's material, you have to um, think about making it a visual product. Um, and in, a lot of people read a screenplay that will be making the screenplay, the producers, the director, the line producer, the actors. So um, they are reading it for their own reasons of how to make this movie. And um, it's your job as a screenwriter um, when you're adapting something to keep that in mind. Um, I don't think anyone reads screenplays for the sheer pleasure of reading them because they're really not as much fun as let's say reading a play or reading a novel. Um, and also now, um, the thing about adaptations, and according to the Writers Guild, and this was a few years ago, 65% of movies produced are based on source material. And source material is the word meaning a novel or a stage play. So original screenplays are like 30% of those produced. Um, and then I went through a list of Oscar winning movies and basically 70% to 75% of Oscar winning movies the screenplays were based on source material. So um, adapting your work or someone else's work is a good idea in that way. Good. Now, what I neglected to say earlier is that oh, this is going to be very heavily based on your questions, and we're going to try to provide answers to those. You should be able to click on a question button on your website, on your uh, screen. And we've already got some questions that have been pre-submitted to us. So we're going to start addressing those. And as you have your own questions, please feel free to post them on your screen. Now, we're probably not going to be able to answer all the questions, so you should just be aware of that. But uh, you can email questions to us at the Authors Guild, and we can try to do our best to answer them if they're legal questions. Uh, if you're a member, uh, you can feel free to send us agreements and any specific questions, because that's a service we provide to our full members. If they're craft-based questions, we can take them and we can try to convey them to Richard as, as we, as he, we and he see fit. So uh, let's start with a couple of the questions that have been pre-submitted to us. Okay, here's one I think uh, might be helpful. Uh, is it even wise to attempt an adaptation of one's own work? Now here's really something very interesting is that um, I discussed this with a lot of professional writers who talk about adapting material and adapting their own work, and I'm talking about Oscar winning screenwriters, um, it's a little difficult to adapt your own work for the main reason of you've been there before, you know the story. Uh, why do you want to go there again? But if you're going to do that, whether either for hire or for yourself to then sell, things you have to ask yourself are, who's the lead? Um, it might seem like an obvious question, but sometimes when you go into an adaptation, another character starts to be more interesting. And I'll tell you an example, and I'm going back a bit, but if you ever saw Paul Newman's movie, HUD, um, I read the Larry McGurdy novel. HUD is in about 10% of the novel. And I was, what? <laughs> it, it was really a small character, but the two writers, I, I believe it was a husband and wife, took that novel and turned it into a screenplay about this character that had no, no reflection on the character in the novel. The other question, uh, other than the lead character, is what characters do you want to keep for your screenplay? 
A novel could have 100 characters. You can't have 100 characters in a screenplay. So what characters do you want to keep? And I always go back to Henry James, that a minor character uh, illuminates the aspects of the lead character. So when you're going to take a character and put them in the movie, they really need to be there for the lead character. And the third question, and these are academic questions, but they're kind of helpful, is how many locations? You know, if you're going to write the born identity, you have locations all over the world, and that's wonderful. But maybe you don't uh, think your movie, maybe your movie's an indie movie. So maybe I need to limit the locations. Those are the three important questions. We have some questions on the board already. Okay. Um, well, we can answer them or we can, I'd just like to, before we even get to those, right. um, since you're talking about yes. the question of adapting your own work. Uh, first off, if it's, a, it's been, if it's a traditionally published book, you want to make sure that you, in fact, have retained the rights to be able to adapt your mm. book into a screenplay. Yes. Uh, a lot of traditional publishing contracts, especially of a certain period, automatically transferred those rights to the publisher under the subsidiary rights clauses. What we recommend these days is that you do try to retain the right to adapt your work and, and exploit your work in film and TV and theater. So we, re we recommend that as a general policy to try to retain those rights from your publishing agreement. And presuming that you have retained those rights, then we go back to should, it, should you, as a craft matter, still decide to do that. And I think it's important, and I want, Cheryl's yeah. thoughts on this is that um, it's really good for you to do that first adaptation because if someone comes along and wants to make a movie of your novel, you already have a, a pilot or a screenplay mm -hmm. based on that material. And if you become a member of the Writers Guild, let's say, there will be an arbitration for credit and you do want that. Um, another thing too, and, and Cheryl will probably agree with this, is that when a producer comes along and wants to adapt your novel, they may see things in a novel that you don't mm -hmm. see or minor things in that novel that they want. Um, for my movie, The Third Miracle, I remember New Line flew me to LA. They, they, had, they were one of the people that had optioned it. And um, they said to me, can you turn your novel into The Exorcist? Mm. And I went, I love The Exorcist. <laughs> It's great. I can't do better than The Exorcist. <laughs> and my novel is not The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here. How many pages is the average screen script? Well, I think for a comedy, 90 pages for a screenplay is about right. For a drama, about 120 pages. Um, it could be less than 120. Um, but for a hour pilot, it's 60. And for a half hour, we know 30 minute comedy. And with commercials, those 30 minutes um, pilots could be down to 24 minutes. I remember Tom Fontana saying to me that his 16 minute uh, network uh, series were down to 54 minutes. So you got to tell a story in 54 yeah. minutes. It's not easy. Um, someone asked a good question, um, asked a good question about, well, a novel has a lot of background and stuff. How do I put that into the screenplay? Um, you got to remember, you're not shooting it unless you're directing it, but you should give the director an idea of the, of the world you're in. But you need to do it really economically and get to it as quickly as possible. Um, I tell a lot of uh, people when they're doing their first screenplay, you really shouldn't have more than four lines, five lines in description without a break. And every time you break that double space, that is actually the camera going somewhere. Um, I also would never use camera angles. Um, directors don't like that. You're telling them what to do, and that's not your job. Your job is to lay out the story. Now, importantly, screenplays are three acts. All right, nobody knows why, but they're three acts. All right, stage play, two acts. Sometimes now, plays go 90 minutes without an interruption, uh, intermission. Uh, novels could be 400 pages. So you gotta look at your novel and say, can I break this down into three acts? The first act ends at page 30. The, the second act begins at 30 and goes to 90 with that midpoint. And then the last 30 pages are the third act. The plot points are very important. Now, you, when you're writing a novel, you probably don't think about plot points. But in screenwriting, you must be really aware of them. Structure, structure, structure is the most important thing to a screenplay. They used to say, and nobody really says this too much anymore, that a screenplay is a blueprint for a movie. Well, the point is it is a blueprint for the movie. 
It really is. Dialogue, don't have a lot of dialogue, all right? Um, when you're writing a play and you have to adapt, you have to cut dialogue and it's really hard. The good news is um, characters you refer to in the play, you could bring into the movie. Um, so those are things to think about. Do we have more legal questions? Uh, yes. When it comes down to, uh, somebody asked us, do you recommend getting the rights to adapt before you attempt the adaptation? And if you're a screenwriter, then yes, we definitely recommend getting those rights before you, uh, before you attempt an adaptation. This all goes back to the copyright. When you write a novel, you yourself are the copyright holder. And anybody who creates a screenplay or a TV series or a graphic novel series, et cetera, anything based upon your work, they're creating what we call a derivative work. And they have to be authorized to do that. So if you want to adapt anybody else's work, into a screenplay or a TV series, then yes, we do recommend that you go and you get those rights uh, to be able to do that. We also have not had another question about what if the rights in your book have reverted. And a lot of our members have that situation where their books have gone out of print. And what we want, so actually one of the services we provide is we reach out to publishers to try to get those rights formally reverted back to the author. And then the author can either reissue the book themselves as a, as a self-published work or, and or they can adapt it in whatever form they see fit. So if your rights are reverted back to you, then you then have the freedom to adapt it yourself or to authorize somebody else to adapt it. Excellent. And on that, interestingly enough, I, I wrote the novel, The Third Miracle, published by Simon & Schuster and then made into a movie, Francis Coppola produced it. And somebody came to me and said, I'd love to produce it as a stage play. Mm. So I read my contract and it said, after seven years of the release of the movie, all rights went back to me, except one thing. I needed to go to them to ask them if they wanted to invest. Yeah. And so get to know your contract, talk to your lawyer, or get to know your contract before you sign it. Um, Deborah Marinelli. Hi, Deborah. I know mm -hmm. Deborah. Um, yes, very good. When you're adapting something for a historical novel, I just did this. I have a novel by a small press called Baroque about Caravaggio and um, got some really great reports on the dialogue. Um, just aside, when I was in Rome when they did the play, my producer said, you know, Italians would not even recognize the Italian that Caravaggio would be speaking in 1600. Yeah. So know your audience, but at the same time, you don't use language unless, you know, that's what you want to do. That is way too contemporary. So I'd be very careful. Um, you know, the British do this great because they all sound like Brits. <laughs> so kind of write like that. I mean, um, and look at movies. I was watching Shakespeare in Love uh, last night, and it's very funny. Yeah. And it's sad, and, you know, but the late, uh, he died 16, uh, 16. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, look at those movies, and, and that should help you, uh, uh, should answer that question. Okay. And uh, another question we had received was, what about adapting a screenplay into a novel? And that's interesting from a legal standpoint, because if you have sold your screenplay to the studio, then odds are the studio has then all rights in mm -hmm. your work, unless you've been able to retain some rights in that. But you want, it goes back to know your contract, and we at the Authors Guild, we review contracts for our full members, so if you have any questions on those kinds of things, feel free to send them to us. But when it comes to your screenplay, again, you've got to look at your contract and see what are your rights under that agreement. And if you have the right to adapt your screenplay into a novel, then are there, do you want to talk about any craft elements of that? Yes, in fact, I'm glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. one of my favorite all-time novels, mm -hmm. written by Larry McGurdy, uh, Lonesome Dove, was a screenplay first. <laughs> it was. He did not write the novel, and he tried to get, I, I think it was Robert Redford and Paul Newman who had, who had done Butch Cassidy. And um, he couldn't get the studio to decide on uh, uh, a, a studio to produce it, so he wrote it as a novel. I mean, think about it. He had a screenplay, and he went to the <laughs> novel, and then he sold the novel as an award-winning TV series. So, yes, um, uh, Going back to my original thought uh, that, um, and I believe it might have been Richard Wesley, maybe Israel Harvitz had said, because I in, had interviewed them, um, when you write and when you adapt your own material, you've got to go back into your own world that you created. Um, someone also said in one of these um, questions, the visuals, you know, when you're writing a novel, 
Um, what visuals? Well, when I wrote The Third Miracle, I only had one idea of the movie. I wasn't sure it would ever be a movie. And it was when everybody had the umbrellas out in the rain and the statue cried tears of blood. And it only um, cried tears of blood in the rain. And I said, wow, what an interesting movie moment. So when the director shot that, Agnieszka Holland, the brilliant Agnieszka Holland, when she shot that, I was waiting to see. It didn't look exactly the way I had visualized it, but it was a moment that she saw was cinematic. Um, so remember, you, what I really suggest is watch a lot of movies. Um, you could go from 12 Angry Men, which was a play in one location, you know, adapted play to a movie, or you can go to Lawrence of Arabia, where it's, you know, was adapted from his biography, and you could see what um, David Lean did with that. Okay. Let's see if we have any new questions up here. Oh, this is a good one. Um, if your novel's being considered for development for a movie, how do you advocate yourself mm -hmm. to be the one to write the screenplay, even if you have no screenwriting experience? I can't say what I did. Because <laughs> I basically said, I'll write it for nothing. Um, um, I can't say that. No. But um, <laughs> the producer was very wise, and he said, if you wrote the play, you could write the, the uh, TV movie. And that's something that should be addressed ideally in your contract too. Very good. Yes. Uh, when you uh, when you allow a film production company to adapt your work, you can put in there saying that giving you the right to make a first pass. And if you make that first pass, they may then decide like you know what, good shot, good on you, but we're still going to have somebody else do it. At least you have had that opportunity. And then you can also uh, try to work with the ultimate screenwriter and hopefully learn from them. That's very good. Um, Two things, if I remember quickly. On my novel, Broke, when I heard they were interested in doing a TV series, I quickly wrote a TV pilot on my mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. So I said, they have to come to me now. Yeah. You know? And um, I'm really happy with it. I really love it. And I followed my novel, for those who have this question, I followed my novel very closely. I kept a few scenes out that did not move the story. That's another thing you've got to remember. Mm -hmm. um, when you're going to shoot a movie, everybody has to get together. You could have 30 people on, on crew or 100 people, and they have to shoot this scene. So you better make sure the scene you wrote moves the story, okay? You can't write scenes and that the director's just going to throw them out. So when I adapted my novel, the first thing the producer said to me was, wow, you followed your novel. I said, yeah, I did, but he didn't realize I added a couple of little things, which was one of the questions here, mm -hmm. to move the story, and I kept some things out. Um, also, when I got lucky, I sold um, my stage play, mm -hmm. The Marriage Fool, that was produced in a little theater, to CBS Films. Mm -hmm. And they cast Walter Matthau and Carol Burnett and John Stamos, and 25 million mm -hmm. people saw the first airing and 18 million the second. And I thought, how many theaters are going to have to be filled for me to have all these people see it? Mm -hmm. So one good thing about adapting your material is more people will see it, okay? More people will see your story. But I got lucky because... The uh, producer, one of the producers, said to me, you wrote the piece, I'm going to walk you through how to do a five-act, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there were commercials for CBS. Oh, wow. I had to do a five-act screenplay, teleplay, of my own stage play, one act being five pages. So, you know, I got lucky there was someone there, but what Cheryl said is absolutely correct, mm -hmm. that you learn from the person mm -hmm. that you're working with on that. Because it's a different structure, and yes. when you're dealing with TV, and you've got act outs and you've got commercials, you have to also uh, try to make people want to turn back in, don't you? Yes, they so call like, those buttons. Yeah, so it's got another, it's, it's yet another skill set that it's a good thing for you to learn. All right, yeah. uh, let's yeah. see. Does the agent who sold the novel automatically the one who represents the screenplay? It can't, they also sold a novel, odds are your agent is going to do that, but you, I think it's a question of, is that agent the best person to help you sell the screenplay? Because uh, traditional publishing agents, if you get an agent who may have great relationships with publishers, that's great. But that agent may not necessarily have the best contacts for, uh, for selling the screenplay. And again, it goes back to, does your agent even have the right to sell the screenplay based upon what your agreement with the publisher is? I think this one's a good question, okay. Amy, here. Um, I also have a question about series. 
the offer I saw for my series had the studio paying only for the first book, but effectively locking down mm. the series and the world so no one else can option them. Mm. They could choose to pay a smaller one-time sum for future books only if they chose to use those books in their adaptation. Otherwise, they've locked them down but might never use or pay for them. Is that typical for series? Uh, I would recommend against that uh, because you're giving somebody rights and, and you're not getting paid for them. So if you're giving them the right to lock down the rest of the series uh, without additional payment for that, then we would recommend against that. And then, of course, we didn't review the contract. We don't know anything about the facts of the matter. But as a general matter, if somebody's going to uh, limit your options, limit your ability to license mm -hmm. or to exploit your own work, then you should be compensated for that in some way. Absolutely. The original material, the source material is that, the yes. source, and mm -hmm. you should be paid for that. Yeah. Um, I like this one. Can you discuss the challenges of adapt, adapt, uh, adapting a historical novel? Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you need to know the world. Um, um, I was watching Catherine the Great on HBO, mm -hmm. you know, and yes, with the set, the scenic design and the set design, the costumes is everything. But also the characters mm -hmm. feel very, very that time period. So um, you need to be very aware of that world that you're not just sticking, uh, unless you're doing that on purpose, as I said before, a, a contemporary sensibility to it. Um, you may want to do that, but you better be careful. That's not what the audience wants. Mm -hmm. And you also should always ask the producer, what do you see in my novel that you want to make it into a movie? Because they may have a different idea. Um, you know, uh, there's the famous book, um, uh, Wild Orchards, that was turned into a movie called Adaptation. Yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he decided, mm -hmm. Charlie Hoffman, decided to just go all mm -hmm. out crazy with it and, and have fun with it. And it was an award-winning screenplay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, in you will know this, right? You sell the movie rights to your book. Um, you don't have anything to say, right? Um, if you're not writing the screenplay? If you're not writing the screenplay, uh, sorry, you're, you're out of it. The process at that point, the studio has optioned the rights and they go forward again, unless you've got some sort of rights in your agreement with them, which odds are as a, as a non-best-selling author, you're probably not going to get those types of approval rights or anything like that. Studios hate to give you those sorts of things. Yes. Um, screenwriters don't always like, uh, are not always invited to the set. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you can imagine if you sold your novel. Mm -hmm. um, someone has been, a few people asked about nonfiction. I believe nonfiction screenwriting rule, uh, rules of screenwriting would apply to nonfiction stories. Mm -hmm. The same three act structure. Um, you may want to use a voiceover. I mean, these are techniques you could use. You have to remember, once again, in a novel, you can get into the heads of mm -hmm. characters. In a screenplay, you can do it with voiceovers, but it's not used a lot. Um, um, I, I think that's one thing that might... Uh, there are techniques in screenwriting that um, novelists don't use as much. Flashbacks. Mm -hmm. um, I did that a lot in my new novel, The White Envelope, not thinking as a movie. But it, for each chapter goes flashback to present, flashback to present. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it because I was creating this haunting murder mm -hmm. mystery. Okay. And I wanted it to do it that way. Um, let's see. What else? What novel traits or characteristics make good screenplay movies? I, that's a good one. You don't be writing them if we know. Um, uh, one interesting thing I was thinking about with screenplays, um, think about it. I've never read Gone with the Wind, but I've watched it several oh, times. I've read it. Oh, you've read it. <laughs> yes. There you go. And, you know, there are a lot of movies that we don't, um, we've never read the source material. So there's really one good thing about allowing your novel or play to be made into a movie is that a lot of people will get to become aware of it mm -hmm. and then go to yes. the novel. Um, on Goodreads, my novel, The Third Miracle, people, I read some of their reviews and they go, read the novel, I went to find the movie. Or saw the movie, didn't yeah. know it was a novel and I mm -hmm. found the novel. So um, it's more ways of marketing that story mm -hmm. idea of yours. And, um, and I think it's really important to protect it mm -hmm. because you know, that, is, that is a really good question. Um, you put all this work into something and you want to make sure that you get the rights to it and you, you enjoy the, the, the reap the rewards. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, somebody asked, I wrote a biography that's been optioned for a TV miniseries. The option has been renewed three times, so things are promising. Good for you. According to my contract, the option holder, producer, has no a priori claim on any prequel or sequel that I might write off of the, bi I write of the biography. However, I'm toying with writing a novel about the biographical subject that deals with his heretofore unknown adventures, all invented. Am I right that the producer has no a priori claim on the novel's character in this case either? Uh, well, again, yeah, you've got to look at what the contract says, but I think also you got to look at what the contract uh, says in terms of, are you allowed to create a work that might compete with it in some way? And is, is, what, you're, is what you're writing in your novel, could that potentially undercut what the, the TV miniseries that this person is trying to create. You may be able to do it as a legal matter, but as a practical matter, you might want to make sure that you're not doing anything that might step on your potential producer's toes. Good. Um, I had a couple of questions about documentaries and I want to answer it because I did get a grant last year mm -hmm. from the Russo Brothers Film Forum to make a documentary, to write, direct, and produce it. And one thing I found is the difference is, uh, to answer this question, no, there is no difference to structure. Okay. I, I actually maybe subconsciously structured in my documentary into three acts, um, or it might have been just accidentally. But there is a structure, mm -hmm. and you do write a script for a documentary. But for me, I found the script vague. And then when I started shooting, uh, and I shot six hours of footage, but I edited it down to 24 minutes. So one interesting thing about documentary making is that you learn from your questions and shooting, mm -hmm. and then you go into editing. And editing changes a lot of the documentary. And I've talked to some documentary filmmakers. They learn a lot about their documentary in the editing. Not everyone, but this was something where I went on the street to ask people questions. I, was, um, I did a B-roll, I mean, me with a voiceover walking through New York City. And then I did a big, small interior shot of a lot of young immigrants talking to them about what they thought of the subject matter of my documentary. Shot three hours of that and, and probably kept 10 minutes because um, I wanted to keep it down to 24. So there's always structure. Don't forget that. Um, novelists forget, you know, 300 pages, 250 pages. Yes, you have a structure. And, you know, interesting talking to uh, Ruth uh, Ava Jabala. Oh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I interviewed her for the Writers Guild. She's the only woman, I think, only person maybe, to win two Oscars for best screenplay adaptations. Mm -hmm. And she says, I don't, wanna, uh, I don't wanna adapt my own stuff. And she also said, once I start adapting someone else's novel, I do not have a responsibility to make them happy. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's quite true. Um, and also, um, when people adapt other people's work, there's a couple of things. Number one, they must be really good mimics to mimic the, 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 the vision and voice of that novelist that they're adapting, or they're gonna impose their own. And I think what Ruth was saying that she was imposing her own voice on those uh, Passage to India, I, I think one of them. Um, so those are things that are normal things that people deal with, you know, and, and have to be concerned about. Everyone gets those. Let's see, do we have, um, how long should a script be? Uh, I think we, we covered that. Um, can you pitch an unpublished novel for adaptation into a screenplay? Absolutely. Yes. 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 Yeah, if you wrote it or not, it doesn't matter if you're going to someone. And let's divide this again to those who pay you, and I think there's a legal question there. Mm -hmm. If I pay someone to write the screenplay, do I own the screenplay, the producer? If you're the producer, odds are most screenplays are written on a work for hire basis, and the screenwriter is an employee of the production company. Now, when you say if you've written an unpublished novel, then again, being a lawyer, I'm going to say, is it why is it unpublished? Is it unpublished because you have not entered into agreement, not chosen to publish it, or is it unpublished because, so right, say your publisher hasn't accepted it? If it's, I would ask you, why is it unpublished? If you have entered into a contract. Uh, with a traditional publisher and it just hasn't been published, then again, you've got to go back to your contract. If you, if it's unpublished for non-contractual related reasons, then go for it. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as you can see, it's as complicated to adapt it creatively as to learn <laughs> the legalities. 
because we are talking about legal rules yes. here yes. that need to be followed by producers. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, well, this is, you know, if I have a screenplay, I want to shop around, do I get an agent? Um, yeah, if you can get an agent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes you meet a producer who's willing to pay you. Mm -hmm. as, That's a wonderful thing. Yep. Yeah. And if they have, uh, sometimes stars um, yes. are looking for material. Mm -hmm. um, and a yes. lot of stars these days have their own production companies. And they're actively seeking material that they can star in or something that calls to them for a particular reason. They may be in a particular, interested in a particular topic or a particular subject matter or a particular cause. So if your screenplay deals with anything that may appeal to them on that level, then you may be able to get the star interested. Um, I also recommend um, registering, if you do yeah. your screenplay on your own, mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. um, with the Writers Guild and where else. And uh, just registering the copyright in your work as well. Because the Writers Guild uh, registration, while a good thing, is not actual copyright registration. Mm -hmm. And when you write anything, first off, you own the copyright unless you're an employee. You own your copyright first off. But before you sue anybody for copyright infringement, you need to have your copyright registered. And that's a very easy registration process. You go to www.copyright.gov and you go online and you register your work. It's very simple. You just upload it and you give a payment of 35 or 55 dollars depending upon the complexity of registration like if it's just you or if it's a couple of other people but it's usually just about 35 to 55 dollars to register your copyright so we usually recommend that too um there was a good question here um, um adapting my memoir into a screenplay anything to keep in mind mind about my it's, well it's your memoir mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you're, is it maybe the structural question. Again, it goes back to the same, like, who is your audience? What are the most important points that you want to make? Uh, what characters in your life? Uh, are you, because if you're dealing with a whole life, I understand the memoir is probably going to be much more focused from that point of view. But a screenplay, I think we have to be even more focused. I have a legal question. Ah. In your memoir, yes. and you're mentioning real people, yeah. do you have to worry about them? Uh, well, you would if you, if your memoir has been published, mm -hmm. then odds are a well traditionally published odds are a a uh, publishing company would either vet it or have had you vet it to make sure that what you say is not going to subject anybody to libel mm. or, or defamation. However, living in a very litigious age these days, <laughs> in any event, we'd recommend that you get uh, that somebody's got to get uh, insurance uh, on that sort of thing, media liability insurance, because. Unfortunately, even if you can be totally honest, it doesn't mean nobody's going to sue you. They may not win, but you still can get sued. So yes, we recommend getting insurance, especially if you're shopping out a, a, not, a memoir that deals with particularly tragic or dramatic or where somebody else may take offense. Even if you say, this is what happened, the mm -hmm. other person may still say, I, I, I disagree. No, that's not true. So you want to have your work vetted uh, by a lawyer and you want to get insurance. And what I learned when we were shooting a movie of mine in Toronto, my father, um, Frank Moore, his name had to be changed because there was a priest in Toronto named Father Frank Moore. So we had to make him Father Frank Shore. And I thought this was some sort of gimmick or trick, but it happened to be for legal reasons. For legal reasons, because studios vet, they, they vet not just the, the scripts, they vet the names, they vet the images you have. If you have an, ac an accidental poster of mm -hmm. like a company or a logo, that can get you in trouble. That's a separate issue. But yeah, the, the studio is going to vet everything that people see on screen. Yes. And even um, My Marriage Fool is about my father and I, and I had to change, I didn't call us our names, mm -hmm. but I did name my brothers. <laughs> they didn't sue me, <laughs> nor my sister-in-laws, but they weren't very happy. Mm -hmm. uh, they're happy now. Um, <laughs> but um, Books to read, someone, a couple of people asked. I really still, I know there's a lot of new books since, but Sid Field, um, and I think he recently passed away, but he has maybe 10 editions of the Screenwriter's Workbook. And I do believe it's extremely helpful for, for screenwriters for your first time and for uh, writers to look at, uh, even those who are, have done a few screenplays. Um, in the later editions, there are actually copies of screenplays and what they look like. Because a couple of questions have been about formatting. I use Final Draft. Um, there are other free 
software. I like Final Draft because I can write my plays on Final Draft as well as screenplays. And it makes formatting so much easier, the interior, the exterior, um, all you hit is an eye and a boom mm -hmm. interior gets right there, formats mm -hmm. the whole screen. Uh, funny thing is a lot of people when software came out, bought the software and thought it would write the screenplay for them. No, you still have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and also there is someone asked, no, there is no software where you take your novel and it adapts mm -hmm. it into a screenplay. I'm sorry, but you know, it's, people have to remember adaptations are a craft mm -hmm. and it has, it needs everything you needed when you wrote your novel. It needs mm -hmm. that vision of the artist. You're just changing it. And I always say when you're writing a screenplay, write as a director. Mm -hmm. um, think of your screenplay as a director. Um, there will be writers, if the producer purchases it, may get other writers to rewrite you. Yeah. And you're going to have to be quite aware of that. And could you just explain to us a little bit, because th this might be helpful. I don't own my screenplay once I sell it. Right? No, you do not. And in fact, it's, it's unfortunately a big pattern in the industry that people get rewritten constantly. And you have to have the thick enough skin to be able to accept that as a, crea as a creative artist going into this. However, uh, in those situations, you will have gotten paid. And if you haven't gotten paid, and that's a separate legal issue, you should definitely see and get the writer's bill on your side to make sure you get paid. But again, TV and film mm -hmm. is where the money is that you give up rights. And you give up approvals in order to get the money, in order to get that sort of exposure to a larger audience. Yes. And you have to be aware of that when mm -hmm. you sign your contract. Yes. I know when I signed uh, my first contract where it said I would get two tickets to the premiere and that was it, <laughs> you know, plus oh. my money. No, well, my oh, money. you got your money. Okay. My money, my money, but two tickets to the premiere and it's like, I might go and not like the movie. I've been very lucky that mm -hmm. I got all my directors and I was invited to Delhi's and I was invited to the set, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't always happen. I and I have written movies, um, based on my stage plays that I had no time to be on the set and um, was not that pleased with the adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, also I have uh, adapted my own work where I just wrote interior experiment. I really didn't have time and I wish I had spent more time. So you really knew, uh, need to spend a, a lot of attention to that. Um, and searching, I'm, I'm actually now working with a, a well-known director on a, a original screenplay we're working together. And we came up in a, we were having a meeting and I, I mentioned this book I was really interested in, I read in the 70s. And he said, hey, why don't we think about making that into a movie? So I, you know, it was set in Europe, um, actually it was set in Austria and it was in the 70s and it was, it was filmed in, in German. So I'm thinking now where, if I adapted it, what do I do? Do I, my director's British, should we send it in England? Would it work in America? It's a sport that's not really very American, you know, so, but it, it is in America. So these are normal questions you ask, you know, and then of course, the first thing is we got to see if the movie rights are available. Yeah. It was once made back in the seventies. Mm -hmm. And this author has been getting a lot of big awards recently. I think he might be in his late seventies now. So these are things that are normal to mm -hmm. ask. Um, it is a business. And remember that if someone hires you, um, to write an adaptation, they're going to be putting money into it. Yeah. And they want to make sure that that audience that read that book um, will be seeing, you know, that in the movie, what they loved about it. Especially if you're doing something based upon pre-existing IP, intellectual property, then one of the reasons that people want to adapt those works is because there's a market. There's people who already have warm feelings up for that underlying content. And you don't want to have mislead people and have them thinking, oh, we're going to see this book and then give them such a different spin on it that they may be disappointed. Now, somebody asked a question. If your novel is faction and the names and important details have been changed, although close family will rec recognize the villain, would that also need media liability insurance? The general public would have no way of identifying the villain. Now, here I also uh, want to bring up the, quest, the issue of something called reps and warranties representations and warranties. If you're going to be selling the rights or licensing the rights to this book, odds are a publisher, a movie studio, they're going to want you to sign off stating that you, things like you have the right to, uh, you, that you yourself have written the work, you have the right to all the words written, which should not be a problem, but they're also going to want you to sign that there is no potential for libel 
or other action it can be or uh, infringement of in, in uh, uh, not infringement um invasion of privacy they're going to want you to make those representations and warrant that that they're not going to be sued on those grounds uh so if you're if you've got factual elements in there you're still running a risk somebody is you're going to have to make a representation to your publisher or your film producer that about those and they're probably still going to want to have it vetted uh and still want to have insurance and if you're not going to and you need to be straightforward that yeah there's there's factually based material here because they've got the right to know and yeah you're probably still going to want insurance mm -hmm. um a couple of questions the title of the sidfield book is he wrote a series of books called the screenwriter's workbook mm -hmm. um I think there's seven or eight editions. So any of those editions are very, very helpful. The later edition, I would get the first edition and second edition and the later ones. The later ones actually have screenplays in it. Um, a couple of other things. Do you take liberties when, um, okay, incorporating historical figures in a work of fiction, do they have to be dead or a certain number of years before one could take liberties? Oh. Uh, that actually the right to publicity is a big issue these days. I don't know if you've heard about Olivia de Havilland, who is not oh, yes. decidedly not dead. 100 and 102. <laughs> yeah, and she sued based upon her portrayal in the TV miniseries um, Feud. And she lost because they found that it was a fair use, I believe, of what they were doing with her. So uh, I mean, fair use is a separate issue, but the thing is that different states have different uh, time limits, the uh, session limitations for right publicity. I think like Tennessee, because of Elvis has like a really long one, 75 years after the person's death or maybe even a hundred years. Illinois also has a really long one. New York uh, is trying to, the state, the state legislature is trying to pass a right of publicity law. But it really depends on the state in which the person died. Uh, their, their state of their last domicile, rather. Uh, that's going to tell you the statute of limitations and per certain period of time uh, during which that the estate might still be able to sue for under the right of publicity. And I, I remember this case because mm -hmm. uh, I watched the series. Yeah. She was actually shown in a good light, yeah. but okay. what I read, she was very upset mm -hmm. that the, the writer producer did not contact her to mm -hmm. ask her permission to be in it. Yes. And I thought that was a very good, um, uh, a good reason for her. Um, okay, we have, oh, this one's interesting about a graphic yeah. novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks I wrote a graphic novel, which was a number one New York Times bestseller. I wrote it with a good friend. The novel was immediately optioned and we were penciled in to do the writing, but not contractually. My friend died last year and now I find myself still value, valued, but not considered the writer. The new showrunners have taken over, but I want to be in the mix. What options do I have? Oh. First, I would say it's go back to the terms of your contract that you say that you were penciled in to do the writing, but not contractually. I would ask, how were you penciled in to do the writing then? Uh, again, it looks like, I think, unfortunately, you've got to see what they're obligated to provide you. What rights do you have uh, under this contract? It's also possible that if they don't, if they're in breach in some way, you may be able to get the rights back or you may be able to get additional payment or credit, etc. I think you've got to look at the contract. What does the contract say about what you're entitled to? Um, it's also, I mean, that's something if you're a member of the Authors Guild, uh, we may be able to look at your contract for you. If you're the number one time New York Times bestseller, then yeah, you probably should be a member of the kill. We might be able to look at the agreement and tell you what your options might be. Um, two, two questions I have, I think I remembered. One, mm -hmm. graphic novels. Yeah, if you're adapting a graphic novel mm -hmm. to a screenplay, it's the same mm -hmm. formatting. It's the same structure. Um, there, it's no difference. And then someone asked about formatting. Yes, the screenplay has a very specific format. Mm, you know, yes, it does. Um, once you write a screenplay, right, and now it's being produced, um, that producer gets the, the script to the director, the line producer. And um, the reason everything like characters may be capitalized or sounds, sometimes things have changed, but they put everything on the wall. All the scenes are numbered. Yeah. And night and day scenes are broken up because you don't want your crew to start seven in the mm -hmm. morning and then shoot till seven in the morning. They'll be exhausted and you won't have any more crew. <laughs> so the line producer breaks the shoot up 
to days and nights mm -hmm. in interiors and exteriors. So that is why it's very important for your screenplay adaptation to be formatted in screenplay soft by screenplay software. Now you could do it on Word yourself and create those macros and it's gonna take you more time yeah. to do that than to write. Mm -hmm. So it's worth uh, uh, buying uh, screenplay uh, software. software. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm writing a screenplay based on right about the events, but the straight adaptation. Do you get permission to provide credit to those nonfiction books? I think that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. um, that is the difference between research and and borrowing. Yes, I think it really depends on a. It's maybe not be a straight adaptation of those books, but what are you using from those books? If you're using a storyline or something that is very recognizably coming from that book, coming from that particular writer's expression then yeah, you're going to want to, I think you're going to want to be on the safe side and get permission or at the very least acknowledge that these, but I think it's a matter of courtesy, you want to acknowledge them as coming, as being a resource for you. But if you were saying, oh, what a great storyline from this, I never knew about this uh, whole thread of this person's life and I'm, I'm going to take, I'm going to copy the way that this author expressed it or their point of view, then yeah, I think you're probably going to want to get permission from them. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like taking quotes without giving permission or getting permission. Mm -hmm. I mean, on a, on a historical book, though, let's say someone is telling you details of an ancient city. Um, I don't think you don't need to get permission for the. Well, I mean, it depends on how if you're taking the any somebody's expression. Mm -hmm. Ideas are not protectable under copyright law. Expression is. is yes. And if you were taking somebody's expression, like some, you may say, oh, this is such a beautiful way of expressing this idea, I'm going to take this and put this in my film, uh, then you're, uh, you're infringing upon their copyright. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a principle called fair use, where it looks, there are four factors that you can explore to determine whether or not what you're doing, you're copying, is a form of fair, is a form of fair use. But you got to remember, fair use is an affirmative defense, which only arises after you've taken somebody's work. So we would uh, urge you to try to be cautious in terms of when you're trying, when you're taking somebody's work, when you're copying somebody's expression, to be very careful, essentially, why are you using it? Why can't you come up with your own? Uh, you've got to look at a different, you've got to go through like four factors to determine whether or not what you're doing is actually a fair use. Great. Yeah. Here's two questions you might be able to. Um, can you discuss how you go about acquiring rights to books or old, old films, films in terms of who to contact? What should you expect to have pay? And my other mm -hmm. add to that question is public domain. When ah. is a book in public domain? Uh, public domain now is uh, Life of the Author plus 70 is, wow. a, is the length of the co copyright coverage. Mo I think they figured it was about 1923, I think now. Odds are books before 1923. Um, don't quote me on that, but mm. I think that's about, those are pretty safe now. Um, how do you go about acquiring rights to books? I uh, go look at, see who published it. Let's see, mm. approach the publisher. Uh, also, if you can find any information about the author, the author's estate. Uh, the, yes. Especially, in, we're in the days of, of the internet. Mm. You can find out a lot more information than you used to be able to if you had to write the copyright office back in the olden days. But I'd say contact the publisher because odds are the publisher would have the rights for adaptation. The publisher may tell you, up oh, the book's out of print, in which case the rights are written back to the author, you contact the author. I was once approached to adapt a famous Hitchcock movie. Oh. It was based on a short story this month. Ah, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I got paid, but I never really asked if he had the rights. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> But his, you know, I didn't know his attorney and we did discuss things mm -hmm. and other writers had been interviewed and I got the job and it winds up he let the rights oh. run out. Oh. So my script couldn't be considered. It was eventually produced. It didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. um, but that is something that you need to ask. Yeah. If someone is coming to you with a, a book mm -hmm. and they want to pay you to adapt it, you really should ask. I, I got a job in Paris. Mm -hmm. to adapt them. Um, I didn't, I would, to work with a director who told me the story, he didn't tell me it was based on a French novel. And then, oh. yeah, I just got paid and I got, a, I lived in Paris for three months, so it was worse things mm -hmm. than that. And the movie wasn't made because the producer, once again, lost the rights. Mm -hmm. um, these rights are not just given, they're usually optioned, right? Yeah. In, over a period of time. Yeah, yes. 
And usually it's over a, bit, a period of months slash years. And if somebody neglects to make the necessary payment, then yes, the option to adapt the work can indeed lapse. Ah, and this, this is a follow-up. Do you have to pay upfront? Up front to, to get the rights to an adaptation. Um, generally, yes, you have to pay some sort of option fee to get the rights to do that. And again, you'd have to get them from the publisher or the author, depending upon who has the right to license those rights. So yes. And that's a tricky one. What, uh -huh. what can you do as an author if your nonfiction book was used to make, make a, a movie, movie without public pressure from the author? Uh -huh. Well, uh, nonfiction, the thing is that, one of the many things is that facts are not protected under copyright law. So to the extent that they take just facts or ideas, the, then you can't really complain. If again, however, they take your expression say the way you structured the story, uh, the ways in which you specifically expressed elements of the characters or the action, if they take your specific expression, then yes, they may be guilty of copyright, infringing upon your copyright. And a very important, as you brought up, you cannot copyright an idea, yeah. but you can copyright the expression exactly. of the idea. Yes. Um, how is screenwriting for TV different than uh, screenwriting for um, there is no difference. The formatting is exactly the same. The difference is, is it a limited series? Like, I don't know if anybody saw Chernobyl. I think it was yeah, six episodes. I think it was six. Was it six? Okay. Or maybe four. Who knows? It's really short. Yeah. <laughs> They're called limited series yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the same rules. The pay is different. Not going to get into the whole Writers Guild questions of all that. Mm -hmm. But um, the screenplays look the same. But there is a difference between episodic writing yeah. and a feature film that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. You know, episodic, there's an episode. Some shows, if I get this right, like, let's say The Wire and Sopranos. The Wire, I think, um, did not solve the question of each episode, while Sopranos answered okay. the question of each episode, mm -hmm. if I have that correct. But, you know, that is the writers, the way they're doing that particular series. The rules are the same, you know, it's same technical rules, the same, the same, uh, um, uh, what's the word, formatting rules okay. are mm -hmm. all the same. Again, I think you'd, you'd remember the same way when you're on uh, uh, traditional TV, when you've got it, you want people to come back after the commercial break. If you've got an episode, you want people to want, why are they gonna wanna tune into the next episode? So whether or not you have a button on the end of the episode or whether or not you have end with like, da 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 on this tree, Again, it's you got to figure out what is it that's going to make people come back. And there was that famous novel. Oh, I forgot now. Richard Brown. Um, um, you know, the, the big novel about the Catholic Church. And the, oh, Dan Brown? Yes, Dan Yes. Brown. Oh, yeah. Yes. Now, I tried reading that. My mm -hmm. agents had given me it to read and say, hey, could you write something like this? There was a button at the end of every chapter. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it felt, it did feel like a screenplay. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of novels I read don't have that big important button at the end of a chapter, but they have a moment. Um, in screenwriting, yeah, if you're going to the next scene. TV series, a little different. Um, you know, th there's a blend now, uh, everybody, between TV movies and, uh, I mean, TV series and feature films. Yes. There's a big blend, mm -hmm. and we're trying, we're all trying to figure out what's happening. Um, there's less feature films. Um, the studios announced just a couple of years ago they're making less dramas. Some of the major studios are making four. And that's like wow. the movies I would grow up on. You know, mm -hmm. now there's a lot of Marvel comic movies. Yeah, there's a lot of comic mo comic book movies, like what they call tentpole movies. Uh, the big movies, the big summer blockbuster type movies. And that's going to be, not, maybe not necessarily differently structurally, but it's definitely a different audience. And you may want to make a different approach. Okay, then, and then also you're dealing with so what if you're make, adapting something based upon not just pre-existing IP, but a pre-existing uh, like series, not series, but like, like, see, like, like series of characters, mm. etc. Then you want to make sure that you've got the rights to adapt, not just the storyline, but use those characters. And also, you, what if you, in your infinite wisdom and creativity, invent a new character? Yes. yes. And if you're in the Writers Guild, let's say yeah. I write a movie and uh -huh. I create a character, yeah but I don't do the sequel, but I, that character is used, mm -hmm. I do get paid. See, that's a good thing to know. And that's a good thing to make sure that you and your, your accountant and your lawyer know that you're entitled to get 
uh, residuals, I presume, based upon the ongoing use of a character that you invented, even if it's from a pre even if it's based upon yes. a pre-existing property, a pre-franchise. That's what I was thinking. Of. Race yeah, the franchise, franchise. because yeah. that's a big thing now, especially yes. with the Marvel comics and yes. all that. Um, mm -hmm. Here's one you may enjoy. I, I sold a um, play to mm -hmm. a major network, and as my, my attorneys at a major agency mm -hmm. give me the contract, yeah. it says in there, they own the play. And I said, no. no. <laughs> and I called the, the big attorneys, yeah. and I said, guys, mm -hmm. that, that means they own my play? That's, I own the copyright yes. and the play was published. Yeah. And they said, oh, well, we'll fix that. Well, you know, mm -hmm. be careful with your contracts. <laughs> that was a major studio yeah. trying to get the rights to so my- Something that they weren't paying for yes. and that they were not entitled to have. So yes, look at your contract, make sure you understand it, make sure you're, and your attorney understands it, make yes. sure your agent understands it so that people can follow up and make sure that your rights are protected. Yeah, and it won't hurt to mm -hmm. get to know those questions that you're yes. bringing up mm -hmm. so you know what to look for. Yes. Um, are some ideas better as a screenplay than a novel? That's a very good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I write, um, I, I don't, um, I, I think of it either as a play or a novel or a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, oh, could this be one, um, all of them? No, it's, it's going to be one for me. Um, when I'm writing a play, it's driven by dialogue. It's just driven by dialogue. And I see one space and I want to tell a play in two hours. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm thinking of a screenplay, I'm thinking that this is something that needs to be filmed. So it's more mm -hmm. cinematic. And when I'm thinking of a novel, it's a richer world for me, language-wise. Mm -hmm. So that is a difference. And I think you have to decide that if you're going to spend a lot of time with it. Are there accredited ones for work for? Who will work with novelists to co-author screenplays and split royalties, etc. Does the Writers Guild have a list of any? I guess members of the Writers Guild, I guess, are screenwriters or TV writers they, uh, who have worked in the industry of a certain level, otherwise they wouldn't be members of the Writers Guild. Yeah, to be a member of the Writers Guild, you need to be hired yeah. by a signature. Yeah, by a signature, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, signature. And um, that means they're paying you, they're gonna be looking out, for, they're gonna pay your pension, your health benefits, mm -hmm. and future royalties, and they have to agree to that. Um, mm -hmm. In the process for getting a screenplay option, similar to the book publishing process, if unaged and mm -hmm. one work goes into a slush pile, well, it's, it's hard because you got to get your work read and considered by somebody. It's a lot of stuff going, coming over the transom does, just does not get read. And I presume it's the same in the, in the screenwriting industry. But as we said before, there's ways that you can try to get to stars who are interested in a certain subject matter. Uh, maybe there's a novel that you, a book that you've written that has a character who you think this star would be great for, and maybe the star wanted to suggest the star option the rights to your book uh, to create a new mm -hmm. role for themselves. Yes. Uh, or there's people who are interested in particular as it's a subject matters. There are like like John Legend's company. I don't think necessarily is just focusing on projects for him, but I think he's very interested in civil rights. Um, so I think projects you I think it's, you go I think you need to do read more research. Essentially, like who is a potential star or maybe who is a potential director, who is a potential studio, because there's so many, there, there's so much content coming out these days. There are people who are developing content for streaming services, et cetera. They're, they need content, and they, but you've got to find the right one who might be interested in the content that you are providing. I think we're got, getting to our, like our last question now, which okay. I think it's got to be. Yeah, all right, yeah. so um, I could talk forever. <laughs> um, somebody had a couple of, I'm listening to nine one try screenplay post. No, I wish I looked. Oh, um, finding a reputable screenwriter. <laughs> uh, you know, all people in the WGA are WFA. reputable. Like yes, reputable is one thing. You, you just gotta, as you were just saying, mm -hmm. actors need to act. Okay, um, writers need to write. Yeah. Um, you and it's so easy to see a writer's credentials yes. online. I would, IMDb. You com. just took yep. the words out of my mouth. Okay. Yeah, IMDb. I just went up 18 percentages. They okay. have green. And red. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Probably because this was publicized. <laughs> IMDb is really interesting because it rates everybody uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Um, I think that's one way to go is to um, 
I can't call the Rights Guild. They're not going to give you a name. No, but go on IMDb. Yeah. But yeah, IMDb. Look for movies you like. Yes, movies you like and movies that may be tonally similar to your, your, your screenplay or your novel. Great. And I think we're at our time. Yes. Oh, unless you want to answer this one quick question. What is your all-time favorite film or TV series adaptation? Oh, wow. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Where is your, what is your all-time okay. favorite film or series adaptation and why? I have to say I loved Lonesome Dove. Okay. I was writing a movie in Paris when a friend of mine had given me the book. Oh. So I read the novel mm -hmm. and couldn't wait to get back to the hotel every night to read it. Mm -hmm. And then when it was made into a series, I said, Robert Duvall and... and Lee Jones, what's his first name? Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones. And I'm like, no, they couldn't. And they were great. So I love that series. That's my favorite adaptation. But I loved, uh, you know, older movies like The Heiress. Oh, what yes, Olivia de Havilland. Yes, but yes I love that movie. The Hustler was an adaptation mm -hmm. of a novel. Um, I'm going to be watching again Chinatown, which is the, oh. might be they consider one of the best screenplays ever written. Mm -hmm. And that is an original screenplay. So, so um, I hope that answered that question. And on that note, thank you so much for tuning in with us. Uh, it will be available. Uh, we will be available through the Authors Guild website. And I can find it. Yeah. Wait, just there. Oh, down here. So, I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all. <laughs> Good afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you all.